Welcome to Igora vs. Headlines. I am your host, Cezare Jurevic. On this program, we tackle the underlying problems and the stories reported by the news media with the best solutions that we have to offer. And by we, we also mean you, our viewers, because by using the Igora networking platform, we all get to participate in the political decision-making process. Today, on our panel, we have with us Lois Jurevic, our researcher and reporter. Hello, I'm Michael Otten, and I'm an academic interested in better governance in society and president of Reform Elections Now. Hello, my name is Alexander Vincent Pronger. I'm an outdoorsman, an engineer, a philosopher, and an artist. I believe in toppling the oligarchy and protecting the environment and building safe ways for people to travel. Public transportation that doesn't supply massive amounts of gas emissions just damaging our planet. Hello, my name is Mladen Pavlov and I have a bachelor's degree in accounting. Thank you all for being here. Before we hear today's report, a quick market update. Currently, the number one idea in the world is still the idea for the universal basic income. The number one idea in the United States is an idea against the Paycheck Fairness Act. And from our last show, the idea for eliminating the Electoral College fell from first place to third place. Without further delay, Lois, what do you have for us? Every year, on average, over a thousand train derailments happen in the United States. The majority happen in rail yards where the train is going no faster than 10 miles per hour, but roughly two to three in a year require evacuation because of hazardous material spills. On the 3rd of February, 2023, a train operated by Norfolk Southern derailed in East Palestine, Ohio, due to an overheated wheel set. The train spilled toxic chemicals and caught fire, but no one was injured. More than a thousand residents in proximity were evacuated as vinyl chloride was drained from five rail cars and burned off to prevent an explosion. A few days later, officials declared it safe for residents to return home after preliminary testing indicated that chemical content in the air and water was below minimum risk level. However, many people in the area have been experiencing symptoms since returning to their community, like eye irritation, skin irritation, coughs, and severe headaches. The Ohio Humane Society has been overwhelmed with sick animal calls, and over 43,000 wild animals are estimated to have died as a result of the incident. A lawsuit has been filed against Governor DeWine of Ohio and the EPA over alleged false assurances of safety. And 18 lawsuits have been filed against Norfolk Southern. Norfolk Southern has pledged to pay for all evacuation, environmental testing, and cleaning costs. They have committed over $20 million so far to help individuals and communities affected by the disaster. Further, Norfolk Southern and the six other major railway companies in the United States have begun voluntarily participating in a safety reporting program, which allows workers to report safety hazards without fear of appraisal. Already, the chair of the American Rail System Federation has spoken out about inadequate personal protective equipment for workers experiencing nausea and migraines cleaning the derailment site. The National Transportation Safety Board and the Federal Railroad Administration have launched investigations into the safety culture of Norfolk Southern. The Department of Transportation is working to implement upgraded braking technology and to increase regulation for high-hazard, flammable trains. The derailed train in East Palestine did not meet the legal definition of a high-hazard, flammable train, so it was not subject to higher safety standards. But on February 28th, the Derail Act was introduced in the U.S. House of Representatives, which would expand the definition of a high-hazard, flammable train to include any train with at least one car of sufficiently hazardous material. Some senators are pushing another bill known as the 2023 Railway Safety Act. 
If passed, train operators will need to maintain wheel bearing sensors, raise their standards for regular safety inspections, and limit train size. Maximum fines for safety violations would also be increased. After a second Norfolk Southern train derailed in Ohio, the company announced the acceleration of the development and installation of increased safety inspection technology and additional hot bearing detectors. At a Senate hearing, the CEO said he will continue to discuss important quality of life issues with his employees and that he is committed to making their safety culture the best in the industry. Cesare, back to you. Thank you for that report. Now let's see what the panel thinks. Alex, I know you've been very anxious for a long time to discuss this topic. I want to let you have the first word. So when it comes to the point of public transportation, I know that there are many safety concerns that must be addressed, but at the same time, we can't be dependent on cars alone to get from point A to point B. This is the United States, and how can we be united when the only way to get from one state to another is a tollway where you have to pay to get from that place to the other? It's ridiculous. I mean, obviously, you have to pay for the train ride or the bus ride, but those options should be much more available than they are. Having a car as your only means is just ridiculous. And not to mention extraordinarily hazardous to the environment. Alex, but we we still have access to the railways. You know, we do have Amtrak, which is the publicly owned rail line uh, that does, it can transport people. Uh, not all the highways are tollways. So can you be more specific about what, what, what it is that you really want here? Nationalizing the railways, making them more publicly available and having more built so that you can get anywhere just by hopping on a train. You can take a train from Chicago to California or a train from Chicago to Florida. It's easy to get from around in the Midwest, but getting around nationally with public transportation is like impossible in europe they have us just crushed in that aspect you can take a train from the uk to amsterdam or to munich doesn't matter they're all connected i used to work for united airlines and when i traveled there on the weekends yeah, I would just hop on a train and go from country to country. It didn't matter. It was easy. See, there we go. We got the N word right out the gate. Uh, and I got to say, I, I've been excited about this topic because I've been wanting to talk about the nationalization of U.S. railways uh, for a while. As soon as I understood what the real problem is, uh, we we need to nationalize our railways, not the train lines. You know, those two things are kind of different, just how you have cars that are owned privately, typically, but the roads are publicly owned and operated. Um, so the same thing you can do with that with with trains. You have trains that are you, you can have different companies rolling across the train tracks that are open to all of them because they're actually publicly owned and operated. The, the, you know, this the, that was a fantastic report, Lois. Uh, it, it was a lot of really interesting information, and it's really great to hear that some of this uh, legislation is moving along. It, it's not passed yet, I don't think, from, from what I'm hearing, uh, but at least it's headed in that direction. But that's just not going to be enough. Uh, those are really nice improvements, but for the, you know, I'm going to get into this later, but for, you know, for the greater efficiency and, and productivity of our railways, we simply have to nationalize them. Mike, yeah, I, I would uh, I would suggest, and I think Cesare, you hinted at this when you referred to Amtrak, which is a federally chartered uh, corporation, but it is charged to operate as a for-profit company. Uh, so it's uh, it's kind of a mix, and I would also offer the uh, the evidence that uh, government, when it runs things by itself, 
tends to run inefficiently. Nothing ever gets closed. Uh, part of the reason our dependence is so high on automobiles is government actions uh, started with Eisenhower back in the 50s uh, to, to basically subsidize the incredible growth of, uh, of highways. And in the case of New York, uh, Robert Moses also uh, managed to create a system of, uh, of transportation where you can't get to an airport easily by any other means than a car. And of course, the, the highways are clogged, so that's an unpleasant experience as well. But I, I would at least challenge the idea of just nationalization was not a very efficient way to solve it. Uh, I agree with the, what Alex has said about the uh, operation. I'm also very familiar. I spend a large part of my time in Europe, uh, and certainly the uh, systems there are much more efficiently run, but they're not necessarily run by the government. They are often subsidized heavily by the government, and there are many policies made that are originate with the government. I'll give you one example. In the case of Paris, uh, they did a terrific thing. They uh, basically changed the fare structure for the uh, metropolitan area of Paris. Uh, it used to be that you got charged more if you were going a greater distance. They realized that they really wanted to make it easier for people to live outside Paris center. And therefore, they developed a fare structure where you can buy a monthly ticket or pair fare for travel anywhere within a, about a 40 mile radius of Paris for a single price so that it actually you would be incented to live in a lower cost area because transportation into the center would be much less expensive. Uh, that is not at all what we have in New York. It's a disaster if you try to live in a outside of New York, going into the city is a major charge. And if there's more than one person, uh, it's always more cost effective to drive. And that's a mistake. Again, something that can be fixed with uh, policies, but not necessarily with government takeover. Okay, so, you know, Amtrak, that, that's interesting. Uh, and I'll be honest with you, I'm, I'm not too familiar with how Amtrak is, is run, but uh, my vision is that you would have multiple, uh, perhaps, private companies that would actually operate passenger trains, uh, but they would be run on public railways. And we see this from, we, we've already agreed a long time ago uh, that, the pub, that the roads should belong to the public because the incentives are mostly in the interests of the public as opposed to short-term profits to build roads that are equally accessible to uh, to smaller towns, to uh, to smaller businesses. If everything had to be private, there would be a lot of people and businesses that would be excluded from the consideration because it might not be profitable. And yeah, sure, it makes sense, you know, if, if somebody is living way out in the middle of nowhere, it's kind of their own problem that they decided to live that far away. Uh, but that's only really when people are living, you know, like in Alaska or, or somewhere out there. Sure, they might have to have an off-road vehicle, you know, to, to connect with the population center. But it does make sense to have some public spending on connecting smaller towns and, and these businesses because they grow. Over time, they grow and they improve, you know, the functioning of the market by offering uh, products, you know, more competitive products. And eventually, uh, as they grow, it does become efficient. And only public, you know, the public perspective can have that long-term outlook to see, okay, if we connect this town to a rail line, yeah, it might not be profitable now, but give it five or 10 years, and that's going to become a significant uh trading hub, you know, or it, it will become profitable over time. This is a good way to actually decentralize our bigger transit and, and trading hubs and um, to actually give people a more comfortable way to live in these larger, uh, in, in these larger, larger cities, larger uh, central, central points. Um, Cause that now they can actually, like you were saying, they can afford to live a little bit further out and, uh, and then commute much more easily. But at the same time, these smaller towns or smaller transit hubs can actually grow a little bit so that the opportunities there are improved. So, so yeah, we're, I, I want to be clear that the, with the difference in ownership of the rail lines versus the ownership of the train lines. 
you're saying that you think it would be better to own to have the roads owned by the, the state and i think they are in a large to a large degree but the maintenance and the cost of maintain uh, basically rebuilding or building new roads uh needs to have some political uh force behind it and is often part of uh of uh financing from the government just like the infrastructure bill in the united states from last year but i uh, i think that's a that's a way to improve the road transportation but i think the the key that alex and i are pushing for is a shift in motivation away from road transportation to a better public transport network. Uh, certainly one that's more easily to, easy to use and more economical for the users. And that's not the way we've been going so far. To my understanding, and you know, this this is why this topic is so fascinating because it is such a big topic, but people know so little about it. Uh, Overall, uh, in in the idea that, that I support for nationalization, there are a, a, a few really interesting videos that uh, that actually lay out the problem with the U.S. railways, and so from from those resources and just a little bit more knowledge, my understanding is that the railways are actually owned by private companies. Uh, they do pay property taxes on those to the government, and that varies. And this is. This is another problem with a long property because it, think about it this way. A railway is like from Chicago to California or Chicago to Los Angeles. It's only useful as long as it functions at 100%. Like if the rail line is broken at some point, it, it, you know, if just one place is or is charging too, too high taxes, then the whole rail line becomes dysfunctional. This is why you need you need the continuity and the continuity can be provided by, um, you know, by a larger entity to make sure that the local municipalities, the local states, if there is a state in the middle between uh, like Chicago and Los Angeles, that's charging too high of taxes on the rail line. Well, then the whole rail line becomes unprofitable. But uh, anyways, back to the point. The point is that uh, the rail lines are private. The incentives are actually completely private. The, the businesses uh, are making decisions to be profitable. Uh, that's how they make their investment decisions. This is why they're not investing in their rail lines sufficiently. Uh, this inhibits productivity. Like for example, a lot of rail lines are actually single track as opposed to dual track. You know, normally on a road, you have, um, you know, you have two lanes, you have at least two lanes so that cars can pass each other. Sometimes, you know, on small country roads, it will be a very thin road, but you can just go off to the side a little bit to let the other car pass. Well, with trains, you can't do that. So either they have a passing track, but really the best thing is to just build two tracks. But that's not where the incentives lie for a lot of these businesses, and that inhibits the the movement of trains uh, along the tracks. Uh, then they're trying to cut, uh, you know, cut costs by making really long trains, and then these trains are not able to pass each other efficiently um, on the, you know, on the passing tracks. Uh, but if you have, and again, this is all because of the taxes. If the government is charging higher taxes. Uh, because of the development on that property, well, then the train lines, they don't want to build those second tracks. They want to minimize that infrastructure to pay lower taxes. But that's where everybody else suffers. That's where the whole nation suffers. Yes, thank you, Cesare. Uh, I just wanted to say when it comes to uh, nationalization of the railways, uh, the crucial thing is, like you mentioned, is uh, funding. And uh, I wanted to bring up a case in Greece because actually... A few weeks ago, there was an accident in Greece with uh, where actually uh, a passenger train uh, collided head on with a freight train. And uh, when they uh, basically what the government says uh, says is that they were delaying the mo modernization of the railways. And in Greece, actually, the railways are nationally owned. So um, that's why, you know, funding is crucial. And that's why I like this uh, bill that was uh, pushed by some congressmen that is going to allow for extra funding for sensors on the trains because these sensors basically make sure that uh, there's no way for two trains to be on the same train track at the same time. Uh, I think what's important to point out here is that we're talking about the nationalization of rail railways, but not the national nationalization of train lines. So trains, you know, you can have 
private trains running on public tracks. Um, but okay, we're actually joined by another one of our panelists who happens to be late. Uh, so uh, sorry, uh, everyone. We're we're going to introduce him here real quick. But it's not really his fault. We have another. We have another great example of the stupidity of government with the this idea of daylight savings time and it we're being penalized for that right here you know even on this program so i, I am definitely a supporter of eliminating daylight savings time uh that is uh, one of the one of the ideas in my ideological profile i do i do encourage you all to support so we can actually have a better running train schedules uh, you know and, and especially with different countries uh you know tra transit with different countries um but also, you know, just it, it's so hard to get people on, on a different schedule. Anyways, uh, Daniel, would you please introduce yourself real quick? Thanks. Hi, everyone. I'm Daniel Tweed. I've uh, run for office three times here in Thousand Oaks for city council and um, kind of as a dark horse candidate. But uh, whatever, I'm trying to get new ideas into the political <laughs> discussion. And what, that's what's great about this this program is it's uh, doing the same function. So, uh, yeah, first of all, it's daylight saving singular not plural time so a lot of people say daylight savings time but that's actually the incorrect pronunciation but it's yeah it's kind of funny that uh we're discussing rail systems and because time zones were actually instituted because of the rails because you had to have you know stations uh timetables that that weren't dependent on local time which which could be off by you know solar time anyway that's a whole other <laughs> discussion but but yeah in a way our uh perception of time is a public good um you know what what we want in the public sphere and in the private sphere these are public goods in fact the uh existence of something like igora that lets us take our intentions our private intentions and fuse them with our public intentions this is an amazing public good i mean it's it's equivalent to infrastructure really because uh if i can digress for a second you know there's something called consensus and that's where everyone has to be on board with the decision before you make progress. But uh, a movement like Occupy Wall Street was gridlocked because they could never come to a consensus uh, for the whole group and the whole mo movement just uh, fell apart because of that. But a system like Igora actually uh, is a hybrid kind of consensus. You, you've actually taken the best of both worlds. So just a, a shout out to, um, good systems like Agora, we, and we should treat that like, like a necessary public infrastructure, because right now uh, we don't have good <laughs> public infrastructure of hybrid consensus. And uh, so a, a, a tip of the hat uh, to you for making that, Cesare. Uh, anyway, should I go on to my rail thoughts <laughs> now that I've kind of you, you <laughs> strayed know, from the topic uh, a little bit? Real quick, I, I do want to comment on that because Igora is, is a public system, but it's a competing public system. It, you know, it's, right. it is a private initiative, but at the same, that's public in that it's open to everyone. And it's an alternative to to the malfunctioning public system that you have now until it can replace it. Uh, and yeah, so it, there, there's a beautiful mix uh, that you can actually accomplish of private and public, uh, you know, entities. And and that's, there's a lot to explore there. You know, it's, it's, yeah, yeah it, it's a big frontier. <laughs> yes, uh, I wanted to uh, talk about what Samana mentioned that uh, uh, probably the government is in a better position to put people first, not profits, because when, when you have a private business, of course, the main concern is profits. And uh, I think even there is a psychological element to it that uh considering the the role of money of course in our society and uh, how much it can provide it's, it basically motivates people to to put profits first sometimes and i can give an example with that uh, because uh, actually there was a utility company in the states that uh, was privately owned and they uh, saved money by using uh, gas pipes that were uh, lower quality and uh, they weren't able to resist the pressure at some sometimes and uh the pipes were exploding and people died and it happened actually more than one occasion and they also had to reduce the number of uh inspections over the years so that was another reason for the accidents so that's something definitely to keep in mind okay so 
there are s several points here that I just want to clarify. What are the benefits of nationalization? I think, it, you know, as Mladen was pointing out with the gas lines, you have these companies that are, you know, trying to cut costs. One of the biggest and probably the first and most important advantage of nationalization is that it becomes a lot easier to inspect and uh, inspect trains for safety and to monitor their movement. Uh, one of the, the the issues with the private lines, uh, they're monitoring the, those train lines themselves. Uh, they're only really respond. I mean, sure, they do have regulations, but ultimately, uh, fundamentally, they're responsible just to themselves. If you have two different entities. Uh, Checking that, uh, checking that safety, that you have the incentives of the private company, making sure that they're running their train safely, but you also have uh, you know, the, the transit authorities uh, that are monitoring those train lines. The other point that I, I wanted to make is that it is much better for the environment uh, to actually nationalize the railways because it makes it much easier to switch to electric. Uh, actually in the United States, basically all the trains run on diesel. And it's not as efficient as electric tra train lines. All these other countries uh, are leaving us behind because they do have the, the government that actually has the long-term view instead of the short-term view. So they're, you know, they're actually investing in that infrastructure for the electric cables to, to run over all these rail lines. But our private companies, they don't have that incentive. They, they're just trying to rebuild. They're trying to s save every penny and they're just keep rebuilding those diesel locomotives um, and they don't want to upgrade. The, and, and of course, uh, and a lot of those, because they're reluctant to also invest in building tracks that are going to be more efficient, uh, there's also more energy that's wasted on these trains passing one another on single tracks rather than just building dual tracks and letting them move along very swiftly. Um, it, it, and the other thing is that if we actually, this is another aspect of investment. Investment is huge here uh, because if we invest in much more efficient train lines, that would reduce a lot of the congestion and a lot of the traffic that moves over the regular, the, the, the roads, the regular roads. So we would be able to remove a lot of cars and switch all of that, electrify basically all of this this movement of all these vehicles. I just wanted to say that uh, um, I what Louis said, Louis said in the monologue in the beginning, uh, that this, uh, they proposed the increasing of the fines uh, for uh, violations. Uh, safety violations and uh, I think there should be also uh, punishment for uh, um, there should be jail time as punishment as well not just monetary fines for negligence you know like uh, we have uh, many laws where negligence is actually punishable by uh, jail sentence for a certain period of time we do have that for for vehicle, for car and you know truck traffic on our roads, it would actually make sense to do something like that on public railways, right? I'd like to speak to the single tracking and double tracking issue um, because uh, that's actually mostly a result of bad taxation policy. The private railroads are actually taxed per mile of track. So they don't have an incentive to double track their right of ways, uh, which is, is something that would be solved in a um, quasi or, or fully nationalized, uh, I, I prefer to call it public ownership. Uh, I, I think, um, in fact, employee ownership is a great uh, spark plug for capitalism because when the workers are directly involved in creating a higher uh, profit, if they're, if, they're, if they're income, their salary is tied to how profitable the company is, uh, that's actually a good thing, and I think you could you could maintain that uh, mechanism in a nationalized uh, rail system uh, model. Daniel, since you're bringing up the workers here, uh, this is my opportunity to to bring up another idea that's to me is relevant to almost <laughs> any economic situation, which is the universal basic income and and the effect that it has on solving so many other problems throughout uh, throughout the economy. Uh, for example. You know, as as Lois reported, 
uh, a lot of these workers that have been cleaning up uh, the, that chemical spill, they're not working in safe conditions. They're not being provided adequate, uh, adequate uh, safety, uh, personal protective equipment. And you know, they're inhaling these fumes. Uh, these, these companies are too cheap and, and they don't want to admit how dangerous this stuff is. Uh, but if you have an option, if you have the universal basic income to leverage more power in favor of the workers, they're much more able to just say, you know what, if you're not going to give me the, pr the personal protective equipment that I need, I'm out of here. Clean this, up, clean this up yourself. Have the CEO do it. You know, <laughs> So we need to empower the workers to be able to negotiate for better uh, working conditions. Yeah, so the UBI, it, it just keeps coming back. I, I, and I will keep bringing it up. Sorry if you're tired of hearing it, but it's just such a big, it, such a big fundamental solution to so many of our problems. But one last advantage of nationalization, you, you know, a lot of people are concerned that if you nationalize things, then they become less competitive. And in a way, that's true. Uh, but in a way, that's actually not true at all. It's actually the opposite of true. It's true. Um, for example, you know, in in our regular uh, roads, uh, car roads, car traffic, vehicle traffic, uh, you might have publicly owned roads, but you have millions of vehicles from different businesses that are able to compete amongst each other in order to create a more efficient e economy. So the same thing with the train tracks. If you have a private company, and ag again, as Daniel was pointing out with the with sometimes very perverse tax incentives, that company can effectively shut out many other businesses from competing on those same tracks. But if you have public tracks, you're able to have multiple uh, train lines using those tracks, competing against one, uh, one another to offer better services, uh, ultimately competing for greater safety, because that's going to be one of the determining factors, whether they stay in business or not. Um, and then it, offering lower prices, better services and lower prices to the consumers. So I think we actually can foresee much greater competition, much greater market efficiency from the nationalization of the rail lines. And keep in mind that our, our rail lines, they're still going to be competing against the, the vehicle traffic on the roads. If their rail lines are not being run efficiently, then people will still have the option to transport things uh, through airplanes in the air or you know on using regular roads so it nationalization does not mean ruining the competition incentive and just to add on to that it's you know we are different modes of transportation just as they're competing amongst each other we still are able to look at how other countries are administering their uh their train lines their you know, regular uh, road traffic. So, so our transit authority, you know, the rail transit authority, whatever it's going to be called, is still going to be competing, maybe not directly, but it still will be able to take cues from, uh, I heard that Switzerland actually has the best rail lines. So we should be learning from these other countries, from the former Soviet Union, from Russia, uh, even though, well, there is an issue with that, but still, they're able to have a massive train system. And we're, you know, just because they're not competing directly does not mean we can't study how they're doing things and actually improve our system based on how other people are doing things better. Okay, but we're almost out of time. Daniel, I want you to have the last word. All right, thanks, Cesari. This is a question of uh, really balancing two different things, public and private uh, goods and also harms and benefits. Uh, the rail system is truly amazing in terms of efficiency. Uh, a steel wheel and a steel rail can can hardly be beat uh, for for moving large, heavy cargoes from point to point. So that's that's an amazing benefit. And a lot of uh, people, you know, gave their lives, you know, to build uh, a lot of these rail uh, right of ways. You know, you can't you can't overlook the Irish and the Chinese who were virtually enslaved and, and, you know, bought this, <laughs> this, uh, capability with, with, uh, blood, you know, so, uh, that should, that should be in, in the conversation, but at the same time, you know, we don't want to tie ourselves to vulnerable 
and obsolete technologies. The rail system is incredibly vulnerable piece of infrastructure. I mean, any any idiot can go out, out and pry up a, a tie or a rail, a spike and create a derailment. So there's that problem. And, and with the whole question of international tensions and, and people acting as uh, independent saboteurs kind of thing, we, we have to factor that into the harms. So, but, you know, we've got uh, technologies like, um, you know, airborne point-to-point uh, -point, uh, drone, unmanned drones are becoming uh, increasingly uh, used. And, and that could potentially offset uh, some good percentage of, of the cargo that travels by rail right now. Uh, we've got self-driving uh, trucks coming online. You know, that's that's a lot lower cost in lives and property damage per mile traveled. So there's a there's a place for for rails to be profitable uh high speed point to point rail which uh china for example subsidizes all kinds of well they don't have to subsidize their authoritarian system but but they run lines that would never be profitable in other countries but they can do it because it's a command economy and you know look at look at the soviet union they they were first in all these space uh firsts you know, uh, because they had a command economy, they could put unlimited, they could throw unlimited resources at the, at the problem, at the mission without having to worry about uh, public dissatisfaction or profitability or all these things that uh, free societies have. So we, it, we really want to balance all those factors. But yeah, I think, I think it, we have uh, nationalized utilities, we have nationalized electric grids. Uh, the rail sector is something that should basically be uh more public than private i'll say that and i mean i think we can run it uh kind of like a lot of the electric grid and utility companies are run because it is a utility it's a piece of infrastructure utility but uh again we have to leave the door open for innovation people talk about hyperloop but you know that's not really proven you know making a vacuum tube 200 miles long is uh, it's some question about whether or not that's uh that's going to even work but uh, high-speed rail can work, and uh, self-driving trucks and drone cargo delivery, all these things can supplement the uh, cargo transportation industry along with nationalized rail. So thanks for the opportunity. That's all the time we have for today. Thank you to all of our panelists, and thank you to all of our viewers. Remember, you have the power here to decide which of these ideas that we discussed are the best. Or maybe you think you have a better idea please share it with the rest of us in Igora. Also, if you want to discuss ideas one-on-one, -on -one, we are building a culture of making ourselves available to one another through citizen office hours. See the meetings page in Igora for details. And finally, if you'd like to be a guest on the show, please see the video description.